Welcome back to This Is Your Bible. We are going to continue our study into the book of Revelation. This is actually part three of a four-part series that is an overview of the book of Revelation. In the first program, we looked at the issues of the who, the what, the where, and the why concerning the book of Revelation, where we saw the who was the Lord Jesus Christ, who revealed this unto his saints. And then the what was the kingdom of God. The where, the kingdom of heaven, established on the earth. And the why, because these things will shortly come to pass, that we should be watching and waiting, lest we be found not ready when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. And then in our second program, we looked at the how, which is, how is this book applied to us today? What are the practical applications? Where we looked at the seven congregations, or ecclesias, which the letter was originally written to, and we looked at how they were exhorted or admonished to do better than they had been. And in specific, the Laodicean Ecclesia, which was not so hot or cold, but was lukewarm. And the warning from the Lord Jesus Christ was that they better change and become either hot or cold, lest he spew them out. And now we're going to go and continue our overview of the book of Revelation with Brother Jonathan Bowen. Brother Jonathan. Great to have you back again. Thank you very much. You know, there's so much that we could have looked at in this book. We've got to ask right off the top of the bat, you know, with all of the things that we've been looking at, how much is there to look at? There's more. We've just barely scratched the surface. But we've had to get an overview. So we've picked out these few little areas that we're going to talk about, but I've really got to deal with this frog-like spirit. I find it to be one of the most exciting sections of the book of Revelation, which is why I want to make sure that we cover it. So let's go ahead and pick it up there because we've got a lot to cover. And where do we pick up this frog-like spirit? Well, we come to Revelation chapter 16 is where the frog spirits come in. And just to give a little bit of context, Revelation chapter 16 are the judgments of God. In verse 1 we read, I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out these vials of wrath of God upon the earth. Now these vials, are a, there's a series of vials. There is seals, vials, and then there's or trumpets, and then there's the vials. These are the last in a series of three sets of judgments of God on the earth. Mm -hmm. And we're going to come in specifically to verse 12, which is the sixth of these series. So the sixth vial, we read in verse 12, the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Okay, now I guess I got to start right off here. Who were these kings of the east? Well, the kings of the east, it's an interesting phrase. We look at it in the Greek, it means the kings of the sun's rising. You think of the east, that's where the sun comes up. And that's what the word really signifies. So it's the kings of the rising of the sun. Well, how do we find out who these kings are? Well, if we come to Malachi in chapter 4, we find there that there is a passage that kind of describes for us these kings and what they do. Revelation ties in with Malachi in chapter 4, and we find there in verse 2, Unto you that fear my name shall the, and what he calls now, the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. So this is the Lord Jesus Christ, it's the preparation of the kingdom, and one of his titles is the Son of Righteousness, and he comes with healing in his wings. Now, we find also the same expression is used elsewhere. It's not just the Lord Jesus Christ, but is applied to other people. In Matthew chapter 13, we have this application given also to the saints. Matthew chapter 13, it's the parables of the kingdom of, of God. And in verse 43, he jumps in, he says, At this point in time, then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. And then he uses one of the revelation phrases, as we call it, He who hath ears, let him hear. Mm -hmm. So he's drawing our attention to this. So it's both the Lord Jesus Christ, who is described as the son of righteousness, and the saints here, the righteous, who will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father when they rule with the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 3 verse 21 tells us, To him that overcomes, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat with my Father in his throne. So here we see the saints with the Lord Jesus Christ. They are the kings of the sun's rising. So how are they connected with this frog-like spirit? 
Well, the frog-like spirits and the, the events going on in this sixth file are preparing the way for the kings to come along. Ah. So these are the events leading up to the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ with his saints onto the scene, onto now a visible open view to the world as we know it. Right now, the Lord Jesus Christ is not visibly seen mm -hmm. by the world, but he will physically return to the earth and will be seen. So when we come into Revelation chapter 16, the Euphrates is there first, the waters dried up, the kings of the east, the way is being prepared for them. Verse 13, he sees three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Okay, you got to stop there because you know I got to ask the question, who are the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet? Well, we really don't have time to look at that in this session. But in our next session, we're going to address that issue. So we're going to come back to that. I can hardly wait. <laughs> well, that's good. But we want to focus right now on the frogs themselves. Okay. In verse 14, it tells us what they do. They are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth to the kings of the earth and the whole world, and their job is to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Now, so, this, now hang on. This is a book of signs and symbols, right? Yes. So what's this symbol and sign all about when it's talking about the spirit of devils? Well, the spirit of devils. Let's turn to uh, first of John chapter 4. Okay. Because John, as we looked at in the last session, he wrote the book of Revelation, but he also wrote first of John. And that, we actually came to chapter 4, verse 1. Mm -hmm. It says, Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, the word there for spirit is the Greek word pneuma. Mm -hmm. Now, we think of a pneumatic break. It involves air, mm -hmm. right? You've got pneumatic shocks. Well, it's the idea of breath or air. It's an unseen force that does things. We can think of a kite. A kite is flown up in the sky. It's held up in the sky, but you can't really see what's holding it there. And that's pneuma. That's the spirit or the air, the breath that's holding it up there. So, let me hang on. I just want to make sure I follow this with this spirit issue. So what you're talking about is, is that this unclean spirit like frogs is going to have an effect upon the world, but we're not really going to be able to see. We're going to see what it does, but we're not going to be able to see it specifically? That's correct. It's sort of a behind-the-scenes type of an idea. And the, and the thing really is it's a teaching or something that's, that's there that it's not physically tangible, mm -hmm. but it's an idea. Uh, it's a teaching that's behind the scenes. Very good. So what about these devils then? Well, the devils, um, let's go to Luke chapter 8, because Luke mm -hmm. chapter 8 has a similar uh, type of expression that's used. Mm -hmm. Luke chapter 8 is the time when the Lord Jesus Christ is visiting the area of the Gadarenes, and he runs into this man who we know as Legion, as he tells us later on. And in verse 27, it tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ went forth to the land, um, and there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils a long time and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. Now, the word there for devils is demoniac. Mm -hmm. It's demons, as we would think of it today, the word anyway. And this guy's naked. And this guy's naked, <laughs> right. So you begin to make the connections, right, with the book of there's, Revelation. Yeah, there's something going on with this guy that's not yeah, right. he's not all there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that becomes very clear because in verse 29, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes to heal him, he commands the unclean spirit, which, mm -hmm. of course, we've been talking about in the book of Revelation, like frogs there, but not so here. He commands it to come out of the man. It says, for oft times it's caught him, and he was kept bound in chains and fetters, but he breaks the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. Oh. So you've got a connection here with this demons, mm -hmm. with the unclean spirits. They're all tied together. What exactly do they mean? The answer is given to us over the page in verse 35. Because mm -hmm. when the Lord Jesus Christ heals him, verse 33, he casts the devils out. Mm -hmm. And verse 35, they went out to see what was done. And then came Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed. Mm -hmm. So he's been healed. What's the difference now between before? He's sitting at the feet of Jesus. He's clothed and he's in his right mind. The right mind. That's the key. That's the key. So the idea of being possessed with demons or unclean spirits is an idea of a madness. Mm -hmm. It's insanity, I guess, is a word that you could use for it. So an unclean spirit mm -hmm. or a spirit of demons or devils is a teaching that is mad or insane. Mm -hmm. 
and it drives people to do certain things as it did with Legion. Well, what now about the frogs? Well, before we get there, I want to go one other place, and that's 1 Timothy chapter 4. Okay. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, we have here a connection which really ties all these things together for us. It kind of pulls the ideas together and cements them for us. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, we read there in verse 1, that the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits mm -hmm. and doctrines of devils uh -huh. that speak lies and hypocrisy, and so he goes on. So he kind of pulls all those yeah. things together. Here's a teaching that is a lie. Mm -hmm. It is seducing. It deceives. And it's described as being a spirit. Yeah. You can think of it in the sense of a spirit of a revolution. You can't really see it. There's not a force that moves, but those ideas are carried forward, and they affect all kinds of people. Very good. This is truly a connecting verse to tie all of that together. But still, i got to go. Where are the frogs? Where are the frogs? <laughs> well, let's go back to, um, really, I guess we could go to Exodus. Exodus chapter okay. 8. Because in Exodus chapter 8, we have there one of the first occurrences of these frogs. And that is at the time when the plagues were given in Egypt, dealing with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Okay. And um, in verse 3, he says, He's going to smite thy borders with frogs, verse 2 of chapter 8. And thy river, so we got the river, remember we got the river Euphrates, it was a different river, but it gives the same idea, mm -hmm. shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into thine house, to thy bedchambers, thy bed, the house of thy servants, and upon thy people, in your ovens, your kneading troughs, and the frogs are going to come upon thee and thy people, and upon all thy servants. Mm -hmm. So this problem is going to affect everybody, from the king right the way down to the lowliest person in the entire empire or kingdom. And it's interesting that in verse 8, this is the first time that Pharaoh calls Moses and Aaron and says, look, I am going to let the people of Israel go. Mm -hmm. But it's a lie. He why? gives them a false hope of freedom. And why is it a lie? Because he doesn't let them go. Ah. Later on, the rest of the plagues come because mm -hmm. Pharaoh hardens his heart. Right. Well, God hardens Pharaoh's heart, and, and Pharaoh refuses to let them go. So it's the false promise of freedom. Now, the effect of this is given to us in Psalm, 80, or Psalm 78. Just go over to Psalm 78. The psalmist mm -hmm. is commenting on what had taken place back in Exodus. Mm -hmm. And he tells us there in verse 45, he sent diverse plagues. and First of all, there was the flies, which devoured. And then there were the frogs which destroyed them. Mm -hmm. Now, destroyed there is literally the word corrupt utterly. Mm -hmm. So these frogs, there was a false promise of liberty, affected everybody from the king right the way down to the lowliest person, and it corrupted them utterly. So we can see that a very negative effect upon the people. Mm -hmm. Now, if we go over to Second Peter chapter 2, we find here a fascinating connection with this because it ties everything together. In 2 Peter chapter 2, we read there in verse 1, just to give context, there were mm -hmm. false prophets among the people. There's going to be false teachers among you who are going to bring in false teachings, the truths, damnable heresies as he calls them. But verse 19, he tells us what they do. He says, they promise them liberty. They themselves become the servants of corruption of whom a man is overcome, of the same he is brought into bondage. Now you can think of that in the terms of the communist revolution. There was the promise of liberty, but all the people that were overcome by that promise were brought into um, ser servitude, I guess you could say, to that mm -hmm. communist system. It wasn't liberty, it was a false promise. And that's exactly the idea that's being conveyed here. So we've looked at this frog-like spirit and we get a sense of what it's really all about. But when did this happen, or has it not happened yet? What's this all about? Well, the time period is really given to us in Revelation chapter 16. Okay, so back to go Revelation. back to Revelation 16, yeah. we find in verse 14 that these are the spirits of, of devils we talked about, the working miracles. They go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world. So this is a universal effect this has, and it gathers them together to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Well, what is that battle? The battle is, in verse 16, he gathered them together to the place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Oh, man, I'll bet you have a lot of people's ears perking up now and bells ringing in their ears. you got to go 
and tell me now, <laughs> what's Armageddon all about? What's that mean? Well, it says there it's in the Hebrew tongue. Okay. Well, the Hebrew language, this is a transliteration, means it's taking Hebrew words and it's transliterating them into the Greek. And so it's just basically putting exactly how they sound into the Greek. So we have to go back to Hebrew to say what does this mean. Okay. And the word Armageddon is actually a phrase. It's three words, arima, which means a heap of sheaves, mm -hmm. gai, or gay, which is like Gehenna, the valley of the son of Hinnom, so it's valley, mm -hmm. and don, which is the same word as dan, or judgment. So it's a heap of sheaves in a valley for judgment. That's what Armageddon means. Wow. So this is the judgment of the world? Well, it's specifically those nations who are involved in the judgments of God that come up against Israel. Come back to Joel chapter 3 because we have the same phrasing here. In Joel chapter 3, we have here context given to us. You're asking when this takes place. Right. When is the battle of Armageddon? Well, Joel chapter 3 verse 1, it says, In those days and at that time when I bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. So that gives us context. He says, during the time when I bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, which we know took place, they were taken captive in AD 70. Jews came back into Judah and Jerusalem. First of all, 1948, the state of Israel was proclaimed. Mm -hmm. Specifically, Jerusalem was recaptured in 1967 during the Six-Day War. So this is the time. But notice what's going to happen, verse 2. He says, I'm going to gather all nations, same phrasing mm -hmm. as Revelation, and I'm going to bring them down to this place called Jehoshaphat, which means the valley of the judgments of Yah. And so there they're brought, and in verse 14 it tells us what's going to take place. It says, multitudes, multitudes, in the valley of decision. And the word there, decision, if you were to look it up, in the Hebrew means threshing. Mm -hmm. So, and then it says, for the day of the Lord, which we read about in Revelation, is near in the valley of threshing. So this is a heap of sheaves, a group of nations, brought together into a valley for threshing. And threshing, of course, was to separate the wheat from the chaff. Mm -hmm. So this is the judgments of God against the nations that are taking place. So that's the context of what Armageddon is. Wow, that is amazing. There's just so much information there that ties in all so together beautifully. I really got to know, when did this really happen, though? When did the frog light spirit go out into the world? Well, the frogs, as you may be aware, is a derogatory term today sometimes used of the French population. I've heard that before. But it wasn't always that way. Back in the beginning um, of, of French history, per se, there was this individual here. Now, this is Clovis. And you can find this tapestry on the shield or the tapestry of Clovis, which is in the Reims Cathedral in France. And it depicts an individual who has frogs on his vesture. They're also on his banner, and they're on his shield. That was his emblem. It was replaced later on by the fleur de lis. But those frogs were there as the symbol of France. No different, as we talked earlier, as the eagle sometimes is used as a symbol of America. So you're saying that this frog light -like spirit is somehow connected to France? That's correct. And this all began, this teaching or this revolutionary thought would have taken place with the French Revolution in 1789. If you think back to what took place in 1789, there was the storming of the Bastille. It's almost over 200 years ago now. And that's when the people rose up. They were motivated by this spirit of revolution that had been taught to them by some of the leading philosophers of the day of liberty, equality, and fraternity. Wait a minute. Three? Three. That's <laughs> right. There were three hallmark ideas behind the French Revolution. That man should be free, that he should basically be at liberty, that he should be equal, and that there was a brotherhood of man. And those three ideas went out, and actually as that French Revolution took hold, it cost the king, Louis XVI, his life. And it went out, not just there, but every level of French society was affected. And it spread out throughout the whole of Europe under the hands of a man, as you may recognize, Napoleon. Yep. Right? So he was the one who came along and he carried the idea of the French Revolution of liberty, equality, fraternity throughout the whole of Europe. Every single country was affected. Right the way down to Italy, the Vatican, Spain, all the different areas, Germany were affected by this French Revolution. Well, 
how did this unclean spirit that was originally started by the French Revolution to bring these concepts alive, how did that bring the nations to Israel for judgment? Well, you have to follow its progression through. Okay. We know it today under different terms. Liberty, equality, fraternity was the idea that began then. Mm -hmm. But it's really been, I guess you could say, fleshed out today in the doctrines or the teachings of humanism. Mm -hmm. Basically, human rights. Right. That man has certain rights and he is free. Uh, it's the idea of socialism. There's communism. There's all kinds of isms, so to speak, that talk about the equality of man, the freedom of man, the human rights and those kinds of things. Now, those have kind of permeated out through the whole world following the French Revolution. Every country just about is undergoing or has undergone changes whereby they've adopted a constitution, a bill of rights of freedoms and charter of rights of freedoms. We've got one in Canada that has basically gone throughout the whole world and many different people have these kinds of things. And so you're saying that that is the unclean spirits of frogs that have gone out into the nations. That's right. So again, how does that bring them to the Valley of Decision? To the Valley of Decision. Decision. Well, if you look at Joel chapter 3. Back to Joel 3. Back to Joel okay. chapter 3. Remember, they're bringing the nations together for mm -hmm. Armageddon, which is the Valley of the Judgments of Yah. Mm -hmm. But notice what it says in verse 1. The context was, it's in those days... And in that time, when I bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. Now, who brings the captivity? Who is it there that's being spoken of? Well, it's God. Yeah. God says, I'm going to bring the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem back. Well, of course, we've seen that. Going right the way back to, back into 1898, the first Zionist Congress, mm -hmm. the idea of Jews going back to the land, followed through by the different events that take place, 1948, the establishment of the Jews in the land, the wars that followed, the 57 war, the, the, or the Sinai war as it was called, the 1967 Six-Day War, the Yom Kippur War in 1973, all the trouble we see today has been God bringing that nation back into the land. And the nations around haven't been very happy with it. No, they you think not. of the United Nations for one, mm -hmm. the resolutions that have been passed uh, some 400 plus revolution, resolutions regarding the land of Israel that have condemned Israel because the nations see there's another people in that land as well. And they believe that e they equally have the right to be free, to be liberated, and to live in that land. So what God has done in bringing Israel back into the land is now bringing the nations who are possessed with this idea of freedom of man in direct conflict with the Lord God himself who put the nation there. So what's happening basically is that that doctrine is going to lead people against the land of Israel. Let's just go to Ezekiel chapter 38 because in Ezekiel chapter 38 it actually records for us there the invasion that takes place and it tells us here that he's going to come uh, it's Gog of the land of Magog. We're not going to talk about all these things. Mm -hmm. But in verse 16, it says, You're going to come up against my people Israel. That's the key. Against my people Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days that I will bring thee against the land, that the nations may know mm -hmm. when I am sanctified before thee, O Gog, in their eyes. And it says in verse 16 specifically, In the latter days, so it's talking about the time of the end. That's right. In Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 8, it's the time when the nation is brought back out of the mountain or out of the nations, gathered out of many people into the mountains of Israel, which is where all the hostility is taking place right now. It is amazing to see how these simply three unclean spirits could somehow have such a dramatic effect on the nations to ultimately bring them to their own destruction in the end and the establishment of the kingdom. This is truly a wonderful concept that I want to thank our brother, Jonathan, for sharing with us today because it is so exciting to see how these spirits are working in the world today. It is a time of the end, and we can see that God is still working in the world to bring about the time that the Lord Jesus Christ would come. He's setting the stage now so that all the nations are in alignment so that when Christ returns, he can establish the kingdom. Stay with us. We'll be right back 
for some, for some concluding thoughts about this whole thing. Thank you. Pamphlets and articles on this subject and other Bible subjects go to www.thisisyourbible.com, click on the Library tab, and select from Basic Bible Teaching, Bible Study, Doctrine, Life, Prophecy, The Christadelphians. In addition to our library, thisisyourbible.com offers online Bible study courses and Bible answers to your questions. Select www.thisisyourbible.com to increase your understanding of God's Word and learn about His future kingdom on the earth. Welcome back. It just never ceases to amaze me how the Bible explains the Bible. We take a concept like three unclean spirits from the book of Revelation and it tries us all the way back to Exodus where we look at Pharaoh and how the frogs affected his household and everyone down to the most common of people and how that spirit of unclean frogs today is gone out throughout the nations that they might be brought back to the Armageddon, the day of judgment. We want to thank Jonathan Bowen for being with us today and thank you and encourage you to continue to come back and watch us as we look at the book of Revelation. The Christadelphians would like to leave you with this thought. Your Bible teaches that Christ is coming and will reign on earth. Are you ready?